Dick Prennicke first came to Alaska in 1950. After spending some years on Kodiak as a diesel mechanic and heavy equipment operator, he found a new home. 120 air miles southwest of Anchorage is a small Alaskan valley called Twin Lakes. With the help of a tripod-mounted, timer-controlled camera, he filmed himself building a cabin and literally carving a new life in the environment. We spent two weeks with Dick one summer and found a man with little need to advertise his inner reaction to the wilderness. His oneness with nature is an experience rather than an expression. Well, the reason I decided to come in to more or less full-time was in uh, 1965. I was helping a welder for a Babbitt bearing on a crab boat. We had a big ladle of uh, molten Babbitt metal and poured it in here and we poured in about a cup full and uh, there was a big explosion and all this Babbitt metal come out just like snow only it was molten lead and hit me in the face and him in the face and it got in my eyes pretty bad and uh, for a short time he didn't know if I was going to see very much but in three days I went back to work but I couldn't see very good, and especially from my right eye, and I was testing on it every night to see if it was improving, and it was several years before I recovered completely from that. I decided that I would quit this racket of pulling bad at metal and that sort of thing, and working with dirt falling in your eyes from under heavy equipment and that, and I would uh, go to Twin Lakes and build me a cabin and, and enjoy my eyesight a little bit if I had any left. were well seasoned and I would see about a third lighter than they was when I stacked them to dry. I worked uh, 12 hours a day, six days a week, and uh, in 10 days time I had the heavy logs up. I think there is a lot of satisfaction in, in having everything that you made yourself. You know, like even your, your door hinges and everything cut around by hand with, with the tools you got. I moved in uh, August the 1st. There was still work to be done, but uh, it was livable. Few 
of us pass even a day without seeing another person. For Dick, the isolation can often last six weeks or more. We wondered what it would be like to live so alone. I can't say that I was ever, ever lonely. I was always uh, busy. I always had something going, to, uh, observations to make, or wood to cut, or letters to write, or something. It seemed that uh, the time was, was short to get everything done. my transportation on the on the lakes in summer it's much easier than hiking the beach if the wind isn't blowing if the wind's blowing of course you got to walk the beach but in good weather why you can carry a good load and travel a much greater distance with the canoe than you can on foot trouble with the canoe on the lake, but if I did, it would probably be the last time because this water is very cold and I doubt that if I was 200 yards from shore that I would make it to shore. I find that a person alone is much more cautious than when you have uh, someone with you because you know that if you mess up, why, that's it. <laughs> In the morning, when you check your sky, if, the, if, if there are clouds and they're moving at a rapid rate, and even though it's calm on the lake, sometime during the day, this wind is going to reach the lake surface and, and you'd be in trouble with the canoe. So I would aim to uh, go in that direction so if the wind did come, I could ride with it coming back into the gas pit. To me, the stuff that comes over radio these days is uh, just out of tune with Twin Lakes country. You know, how, how does that sound? All the problems the world's got in a place like that? I just couldn't see it. I didn't want to hear it. I just thought, boy, this is, this is pretty nice here. Let's not spoil it. You know, it's like an old sourdough in Anchorage told me. He says, uh, People come up here from the States and they say, gee, it's nice here. No hustle and bustle and really take it easy. And he says they're not here 30 days until they're trying to make it like it was where they came from. And then you have uh, pretty much all the game. You have sheep and you have bear and caribou and moose and... Uh, Many places have more of each, but not all of them. So that makes Twin Lakes a little bit special. I hesitate to go on the mountain unless there's a good breeze. Because if it's calm, 
or just a very light beast, why, you can't get close to what he'll, you know, spot you sooner or later. And if you've got a good steady beast in one direction, why, you can get real close within 100 feet or even less you know, without the bear detecting him. But stay off the mountain if it's calm. But he would leave, you know, and that's the end of the show then. The two bears that I uh, observed through the winter, they went, one went in uh, October the 10th, and the other one went in about October the 27th. The last one was a, a sow that went in, and when she came out on May the 2nd with twin cubs, she had been in there since uh, October the 27th, so I figured it was six months and better that she'd been in the den. I practiced the bear system. In summer, uh, get up early and go late, and in the winter, it's just the opposite. Go to bed at 8 o'clock and get up at 8 o'clock. When you live down in the valley, you know, and you got mountains all around, you can't see out. And uh, to climb once in a while and get up on top and look across the top and see new country and, and such as that, I think, is, uh, is a good feeling. I mean, you're, you don't feel like you're isolated or anything like that, you know. It's just you're up where you can see. Vic's camera is his poet's pen. His eye caught the smallest elements of the vast beauty of the land. Then you climb high on a mountain like that, and maybe you'll find maybe just one little flower of a certain species, and just one, and you can walk for an hour and not see another. Makes you wonder how that one little flower happens to be there by himself. No more around. Here's the red squirrel, feeding on spruce cones. There's a little seed in each petal of the cone, and uh, that is what he is uh, feeding on. He picks the petal and, and he sorts out that little seed. fished quite a bit. I lived on uh, trout to a great extent for meat and uh, and berries. But I didn't kill any big game because for one man it's too much. Too much meat, too much would go to waste. During the first winter I spent at Twin Lakes. I'd cut a hole in the lake ice to get water for cabin use. On one occasion I decided to do some uh, ice fishing. So I baited a hook and uh, dropped it in and I went out about a an hour later, and I had a nice uh, big lake trout. I pulled him out and put him in a dish pan and let him swim around a while and took him back out and slipped him back in again. I, I just felt that that was a good place for him, was down there in that nice cold water. And I had plenty to eat anyway. Usually, uh, along, oh, after mid August, you'll begin to see those red red leaves and maybe a few yellows of the balsam poplar. And by the middle of September, well then your colors are usually the best. What I noticed most about the fall colors that uh, Twin Lakes country was the, the amount of reds in the colors. There's reds and greens and browns and yellows, but predominantly red. And on one side of the lake, on the south slopes, the predominant color is yellow because of the balsam poplar and, and trees of that sort. And on the other side, it's uh, predominantly red because of the bald birch and, uh, and the blueberry, blueberry leaves.
The caribou is an animal of the open country. He likes to get up on the high ridge where the breeze blows to keep the insects away. Well, no, she might not see him from all summer long until running season, and then he loses all his good sense and comes right out in the open and afraid of nobody, and that's when hunting season opens and that's end to end. Somebody's looking for him. With anything, with any game, sheep or caribou or moose or bear, just get in there and get your pictures and quietly move out and just leave them like they were. colors are really bright about September the 15th. They might last for a week in this condition and then uh, suddenly they turn brown. And then you might get a, a, a good dusting of snow, just enough to make the countryside look gray. October the 1st, the creeks might start to freeze along the edge and snow creeps down the mountainsides and, and by the 10th of October, it can look like winter and uh, creeks be freezing up and waterfalls freezing. And uh, you can uh, figure on the winter setting in soon after October the 10th. below. Why would Dick stay? Perhaps curiosity. I was always anxious to get out after good snow because they say after snow you know who lives in the country. When you're out uh, snowshoeing and uh, you see tracks you can, uh, well you can determine the concentration of rabbits where they are. And if you see a good number of rabbit tracks, usually there's the tracks of the lynx cat, which is raised on the rabbit, and tracks of the fox, and the wolverine, he runs his circuit. During the past winter, especially, there was uh, seven or eight rabbits that uh, congregated close to my cabin. They would uh, just move in and stay, and you'd move out a few hundred yards, and you'd see very few tracks, and it appeared that they sensed that they were safer there because of the fox and the lynx cat, and so they just gathered around close and stayed throughout the winter. I knew this ermine was in the wood pile, and so I went for the, a scrap of meat to tack to a wood log there and uh, see if I could get him out for pictures. Put the meat on the wood log and then went for my camera gear. And when I came back, sure enough, he was there. And an ermine, when he gets a taste of blood, he becomes very bold, and it was no problem to get uh, good footage. first winter I was there, throughout the winter, the ice was groaning and cracking continually. Just day and night, the ice was just, just talking something terrible. When the ice is young and thin and freezing hard, why, it has a sharp, sharp uh, crack to it, a sharp report. As the ice grows thicker, it gets deeper, and when it gets uh, four feet thick, well, then it's very low key.
During the short days of winter, the sun is very low. It fails to uh, strike my cabin from uh, November the 7th until February the 3rd. But you climb the mountain across the lake, and uh, of course there, the sun is very low. But it does uh, clear the mountain and uh, shine on the slope where the sheep are feeding, and uh, this gives uh, the snow and uh, the general appearance of the landscape uh, kind of a, a rosy glow. When snow comes in fall, of course, the sheep are there for the winter, and uh, they must uh, either dig or starve, and so they, uh, they dig like uh, a horse or a domestic sheep. They will fall with their front foot and uncover feed, and, and then they eat and move forward. The ice breakup is a, is a great event in the wilderness because it uh, means the end of a long winter. After about seven months, you are really happy to see the ice go out. During the winter, the ptarmigan is white. But as spring approaches, he begins his change from white to brown. First his head and neck. And then you will see speckled or brown feathers about his body. And eventually, he will be a brown bird, which is his summer color. Well, I think the caribou is, is bothered more by insects than any other big game animal in Twin Lakes country. The insects bother them to such an extent that uh, they will just take off and run, sometimes in one direction and then just turn around and run in the other direction just to create a breeze to get rid of these insects. About the first days of summer, that's when the, the big herd is formed, you know, cows and calves, and there's some bulls in the bunch. From this big herd, small bunches will split off and uh, come up the into Twin Lakes country, up along the lower lake, the upper lake, and up into the, the high mountains above. After the snow is gone in the low country, they go to the high country to rest on the snow patches up there where 
the insects are not a not a bother. In order to get close, I uh, aim to move while they're moving, because they only detect movement. If they're moving when you're moving, they won't notice you. But if they're standing still and you move, they'll spot you right away. Well, caribou will will lie down, and oftentimes they'll stretch out and lay flat. You, I've seen maybe a group of a dozen that would just just lay out flat, and you would swear that they was all dead. After weeks of isolation on Twin Lakes, Dick shifts to his own time. When the sun is directly in line with the edge of his cabin and the mountain peak behind his house, it's 12 noon. Each of us creates our own world. Dick has found a place and a lifestyle that have put him in touch with the rhythm of earth and life. It's kind of hard to come out of civilization and, and uh, fall in again, you know, to the way things go, you know, after you've been in there. Well, you get to be a brush rat. <laughs>